All right. So question number one I'm going to answer is uh, somebody commented in a YouTube video. He made this comment about, hey, I used to love your channel. It used to be all about no sharing knowledge and education, and now you're just selling stuff. Um, and the question is, you know, why do we sell products? Okay. So uh, I did reply to the guy. And, and so here's the reality. This di digital media is very expensive. Um, I've spent you know, some $700,000 since 2018 on digital media. I, I, in fact, it's probably a little bit more than that by now. Uh, we only started doing paid content really for two reasons. Um, number one, by request. Well, when we created the Discord server and we created this community, <clears throat> we created the Discord server in August of 2020. And we had no intent of doing paid content at that time. Um, you know, there was no intention that we were going to do paid content. What happened was people who joined the community who had been following the YouTube channel for a long time asked if we would do a mastermind session. So they, that when we, when we were talking in the discord server, and we had asked, they said, Hey, will you do like, you know, could you do a mastermind session? Um, where you answered more things more in depth. So that's where the very first product came from was, okay, if we're gonna make a huge commitment to do mastermind, which by the way, for every mastermind session that we do, um, I put in up to 40 hours of time to get that session prepared. For this MES bootcamp, which has been something people have been asking for for a year at least. Our CFO calculated that it would cost me, if I wanted to do the MES bootcamp, my cost would be $20,000 just to teach it. It would cost me that much with what we have to pay everybody and all our overhead and the bootcamp would cost 20 grand. So if we don't, if we don't charge for it, <clears throat> that's $20,000 more I'm paying myself, which by the way, I don't really have a problem with, um, but I'm not the only one here. You know, I have employees, I have team members, I have, they have families, they, you know, they all work really hard and they're not going to do their stuff for free. I will. I, I, I've done a lot of my, I've given a lot away for free. Okay. So for the boot camp, the calculation was our, our break even number is 20 grand. <clears throat> I've spent $700,000 on digital media. We have definitely not made $700,000 back <laughs> in digital media. All the the paid content that we do is really just offsets the cost. Uh, we make we make the vast majority of our money from our clients. That is, and when I say clients, I mean manufacturers. And what we do is we take a portion of the revenue that comes back to us through manufacturers through their increased profitability and we pass that on to the community to help educate engineers who can support those same customers right then that's all part of our mission of saving creative middle class jobs so why do we have paid content it's really two reasons it, well let me, let me talk about the pricing how do we determine how to charge something what to charge for something so <clears throat> And you guys might care about this, right? The, we, there are three mandates that I give our team when the decision was made that, hey, we're gonna do free content and then the stuff that requires the, mat, the most amount of effort will, that'll be a commercial product. But, there's, but if we're gonna charge, we're gonna charge what's fair. So there's three things, um, three mandates. Number one, I don't, I don't want to help integrators, OEMs, manufacturers who are not principled capitalists. Okay. So I don't want to make it easier for someone who's going to use capitalism to exploit other people to exploit. Okay. So number one, I want to price those people out of buying our products and then use what they learn to exploit others. Okay, so that's number one, okay? 
Uh, number two, it need we need to be able to access as many people as humanly possible. So right now our team is working on, you know, uh, international pricing. Like, you know, the U.S. dollar is worth 20 times, 100 times as much as other currencies in, you know, around the United or around the world. Um, and we're looking at, you know, how do we attract more people from India, from South America? And we're putting together pricing that works for them based on the region that you you live in, okay? We want to access as many people as humanly possible to have the, the greatest impact. And number three, keep us in business. Not get us, get us a profit margin of X or, you know, we want, you know, 50% gross profit margin, blah, blah, blah. No, it's literally the mandate is keep us in business. So those are the three... Um, focuses on pricing. We're never going to stop doing free content. We're, I mean, that's still it's still our bread and butter. In fact, we just finished developing. Um, you know, I just spent f- over ten thousand dollars on a new on uh, just on renovations to expand our studio. We expanded our offices, which is costing me another twenty five thousand a year. I think I increased our expenses by twenty five thousand to expand the offices so we could expand our uh, our studio. I mean, this stuff costs a lot of money <laughs> to take the message to other people. It really does. Um, so when people are like, hey, you know, you should give every single thing away for free, you know, I, I mean, it just doesn't, you know, this costs a lot of money and we, and we have to, the community has to help us cover some of it. You know what I mean? I definitely pay a disproportionate amount of my share. I think most people in my place are going to be spending a lot less of their own money to, to fund this kind of stuff. Okay. So, um, and I appreciate the community supporting us. I really do. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, that's the answer to that question. Question number two. Um, I was thinking about this last night while I was reading. So when we got to the hotel and, um, You know, Vicente and his production assistant, Jared and Josh, they all went out to dinner and charged up the Tesla and everything. And I stayed in the room and read. And while I was laying down, I was, I was, uh, I was reading a article on automation.com about industry 4.0. I'm actually going to shoot a separate video on this. Uh, And a lot of times when I'm reading these articles, I'm shaking my head. I'm like, no, 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 no. I like that piece, but no, this, this isn't it. Obviously, you don't do these types of projects or whatever. Um, but <clears throat> a question that I do get a lot is, you know, how do I develop my skills? Like, how do I, I want to, you know, I'm a young engineer, I'm an engineer in my 40s, or I want to redefine my, my skill set. How do I develop my skills? And so I, I oftentimes struggle with that answer. You know, because it's a multi-pronged response. It's, you know, one, it's one part getting education externally. It's another part collaborating with a much larger community. It's another part getting your education internally, you know, innovating on your own. So I, I put that answer into basically three pieces. So number one, If you want, if you want to do digital transformation for your career, this needs to be the focus of your life. It's not the only thing in your life, but it needs to be the focus. If you're an industry 4.0 professional, it's like being a brain surgeon. A brain surgeon is always a brain surgeon. When, even when they're on 4th of July, when they're, you know, setting off fireworks with their family, they still have to answer to their customers. They, and I have many friends who are doctors and they never, ever, ever, ever just go to the lake and hang out all day and not, and not at least respond to the answering service once or twice when they get a, a call from a patient, okay? So number one, if, to being an industry 4.0 professional is about making this your life. And, and, and that is, doesn't, that's not as crappy as it sounds. 
one of the things I preach all the time is I am always at work and I'm always at home. I don't have home time and I don't have work time. We live in a, a day and age where I can, I can relieve my home stress and work stress at the same time by not allowing my home stress to build up during the day because I've got three or four to-do items that build up while I'm at work and then I got to go do those four things at home when I get home. If a problem pops up at home that I got to address, I address it the moment it pops up. Same thing at work. I do the same thing. I just sort of deal with things as they come in. Okay. But being an industry 4.0 professional is about making this your life. Right. So for example, when most people in the evening are reading, you know, are flipping through Facebook or they're watching reels on Instagram or they're, you know, doing some other mindless thing. I'm reading, you know, 2600 and, and articles on Medium and I'm reading automation.com and I'm I'm clicking on links that people sent to me and I'm and I'm reading them passively. If I get to an article that I think, "Oh, this is something I really need to study. I have to have my work mind on, my my work hat on." I'll save it, or I'll pin it, I'll, I'll save it in in a uh, pocket or something, and I'll, and I'll re- set aside an hour at work to go through that in depth and take notes. But what I try to do is I try to make my profession and my downtime congruent with one another. So when I'm on vacation, I bring books and articles that are professionally related. It doesn't mean that I don't read fiction. It doesn't mean that I don't listen to audiobooks that have nothing to do with my profession. But 50% of the time when I'm in my downtime, I am reading articles and I'm reading, you know, I'll read the release notes. Like when Ignition comes out with a new release. I mean, ask yourself this. When Inductive Automation comes out with a new release, do you sit down and read the release notes of the new release that comes out so that you know the new features that are in that new release. The moment they come out, do you read them? Honestly, I do. <laughs> I know I, I since like version 7.7 or something, I've read every single release note since 7.7. I could probably reasonably go through a genealogy of Ignition, like on a whiteboard, I could probably get pretty close Maybe not with the minor releases, but definitely with the majors. I do that for Tatsoft. I do that for System Platform. I do it for all the Factory Talk products. And I do that for fun. (laughs) To stay up to speed on my profession. So number one, it's got to be who you are. It's got to be your life. You can't do that. There's no way to do this passively. This is why... So many really, really smart people who get into this profession grow too slow. But it's also why people like Dan Riken, Dave Schultz, Kevin Jones, Mario Ishigawa, you know, long list of Brendan Riley, all these other people from our community who have really made this their life, the centerpiece of their their life. They're always at work, they're always at home. Industry 4.0 professionals who they are, John Sindrich, right? And how they have grown They've gotten a decade of growth, career growth, in just two years. So it's gotta be your life. I mean, this has gotta be who you are, okay? Number two, you need to generalize on the entire stack. You need to become fluent, focus on fluency in the entire automation stack. When someone's talking about ERP, you got to be able to talk knowledgeably about ERP. How are ERPs built? What are the key capabilities? What are the core competencies of an ERP system? What does cloud mean? What's the difference between cloud and on-prem cloud? Uh, why do people even build cloud platforms? And what's the key? Re- what's the reason you would use a cloud platform versus not using a cloud platform? You know, supervised control and data acquisition. What are the top five or 10 capabilities all SCADA systems have in common? What are the top three or four? How, how often is it that 
three or four different SCADA platforms. What are the what are the the reasons that you would pick one platform over the other, right? You have to have fluency in the entire stack. Doesn't mean you gotta be an expert, but you gotta, you have to have fluency, all right? Um, the last thing is you have to focus on being able to convey your message, becoming an expert in something, becoming a professional in a field means being able to convey that you are the expert in that field or at that subject matter when the time comes. So one of the things that we don't talk about this a whole lot, it, uh, this is one of the lessons in mastermind later in the year, but the one of the things is how to formulate your arguments, how to pick and choose which topics you're going to cover when you're having, you're in a meeting and which ones you're not going to cover. How do you pick a, how do you know a battle is worth fighting? You know, what, what do you mean, Walker, when you say, win the results war, don't fight theoretical battles? Does that mean that you never talk about theory? Of course not, right? Sometimes you talk about theory. When do you talk about theory? Who do you talk about theory to? So understanding how to convey your message, okay? And I, I wanna say this, how you convey your message has to work for you. This is a really important thing. Alan Ramsey, who is, uh, he's our DTMA specialist, he's been an engineer for a couple decades, lots of experience. When he came to 4.0 Solutions to start doing digital transformation maturity assessments for us, and he was going through the training and sitting in on DTMAs that I was, I was doing, one of the things that I told Alan was, Alan, don't do DTMAs the way I do them. Do them the way you do them. Do them the way Alan would do them. Like there are certain things in our DTMA process that are in bold red. Can't change this. This question must be asked. This meeting must be had. This document must be made, right? These considerations um, must be considered. But a lot, the, the implementation, the bedside manner, um, that's you. That's all you. And it's all a function of how Alan is most comfortable conveying his message. Anyway, hopefully that's valuable. Uh, with that, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.